Hello and welcome to Grasping Reason, a channel about history, philosophy and art. This time in our pre-Socratic series we'll take a look at Anaximenes of Miletus. Anaximenes is the third of the three Milesian pre-Socratics, active after Anaximander, who is sometimes referred to as his teacher, and the much earlier Thales. Each of the Milesian school came from the town on the western coast of the Anatolian peninsula, Miletus. We can place him somewhat reliably in the latter half of the 6th century BCE, but not much later. We know he wasn't active much into the 5th century BCE, simply because we know that Miletus was destroyed in the early years of that century. Again, as you would probably expect, we have no surviving book from Anaximenes, but there are a few quotations by other ancient, although not as ancient, writers that firmly indicate that he did in fact write down his thoughts. There is also, I would argue, a clarity in the ideas expressed in Anaximenes' name that simply wasn't there for his immediate predecessor although that probably says more about me than Anaximander. With all that said, let's jump in. As with Thales before him, Anaximenes elevated a single element to the position of primacy in the natural world, and this time the element was air. In this, Anaximenes may be making an attempt to clarify the mythopoetic ancient Greek literature in philosophical terms. Air as breath was firmly associated with the soul in these ancient myths, and we can find sayings such as he breathed away his soul in Homer's Iliad, indicating the life of a man just slain, escaping the body as air. In many places throughout the epic, we also see that the soul is seated in the breast, which indicates a further conflation between soul and the air which occupies the lungs as breath. An example that will crop up later in this video shows us that Anaximenes doesn't draw a distinction between breath and air, so we don't need to either. At first glance, the assertion of the primacy of air then appears to be a kind of continuation of what would amount to common knowledge at the time of Anaximenes. I think it's fair to assume that the correlation between soul and air in these ancient sources was probably a determining factor for Anaximenes, choosing air as a primal source for things. We obviously can't know for sure, however. While the ancient myths don't appear to make an explicit assertion that air is somehow primary, the importance of the soul is inarguable. As I mentioned with Homer a moment ago, the soul is equated with life and therefore all the actions of a life can, in some way, find their source in the soul. Further, it appears that this soul could be bestowed to a human by a god breathing into them. We see this again in multiple places in the Iliad but also at the outset of Hesiod's Theogony, where Hesiod claims Zeus's daughters, which I take to mean the Muses, breathed into me wondrous voice, so that I should celebrate things of the future and things that were aforetime. If this was the prevailing thought at the time, it doesn't seem like much of a leap of the imagination for Anaximenes to apply the same thinking from breath to the wider air around us. The Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy makes this connection for us. In early Greek literature, air is associated with the soul, the breath of life, and Anaximenes may have thought of air as capable of directing its own development, as the soul controls the body. We should, of course, be wary of taking this as Anaximenes thought, he doesn't explicitly make these connections himself. But there is evidence that for Anaximenes, air has a similarly divine nature than that breathy soul. In discussing some sources from antiquity on Anaximenes' thought, Kirk, Raven and Schofield highlight that there is at least an equation between the reputation of Anaximenes' thought and the idea that air is the source of the divine gods themselves, who in turn would bestow the divine air to humanity in the form of the soul. That implies that air is not just the ultimate source of all material things, but also the ultimate source of the divine too. That air itself was divine is implied both by Aristotle's generalization and by Aetius, who gives a stoicizing description of the kind of divinity involved as powers permeating elements or bodies, i.e. a motive and organizing capacity that inheres in varying degrees in the constituents of the world. Hold on, you may be saying. 
We might have established that air could be the source of the divine for Anaximenes, but when did we establish that air is the ultimate source of material things? Well, my imagined inquirer, other than me saying earlier that Anaximenes believed air as the primary source of things, there is also some explicit discussion by Anaximenes' ancient biographers of how this process is supposed to occur. And namely, this is the process of either rarefaction or condensation. Rarefied, air becomes fire. More and more condensed, it becomes progressively wind, cloud, water, earth, and finally stones. The rest, says Theophrastus, come to be from these. As you may have gathered, by condensation we mean here the process of condensing, of an increasing density of a thing. And rarefaction means, conversely, the process of becoming less dense. So, for Anaximenes, when air becomes less dense, it becomes fire. And when air becomes more dense, it becomes wind, cloud, water, earth, stones, in that order. In some of the ancient sources, we see the condensing aspect of this change described as felting, the process of condensing wool to create another type of fabric, felt. This might not be Anaximenes' own words, but it offers a practical, almost empirical description of the process. With this description of change from a primary source, I think we see the most explicit definition, out of all the Milesians, of a single element being a primary source of all things. Thales, Anaximander and Anaximenes are often taken together as material monists, but neither Thales, when discussing water, nor Anaximander, when discussing a pairon, give us the process by which this is supposed to occur. As Kirk, Raven and Schofield states, such changes were accepted by all the pre-Socratics. It was only Anaximenes who explained them solely in terms of the density of a single material. We should be wary of the material monist label, however. Personally, I struggle to see how the label truly applies to the other Milesians at all. But even with Anaximenes, we don't see firm confirmation that he believed that after changing, the other elements remained air in actuality. The density of air also has another interesting factor, according to Anaximenes, that it equates to temperature. Or I should say, according to Anaximenes, according to Plutarch. Yet the wording from Plutarch suggests he was dealing with a primary source. The suggestion is that rarefied air becomes hotter and denser air becomes colder and that this can be applied to the scale of rarefaction to condensation that we discussed earlier from fire to stones. Using the example of exhaling breath through the mouth, he suggests that the breath is chilled by being compressed and condensed with the lips, but when the mouth is loosened, the breath escapes and becomes warm through its rarity. We don't need to consider the merits of such an argument, thankfully as we all know today that it wouldn't stand up to scientific investigation. But it is certainly notable that identifiable opposites, hot and cold, were being explained with reference to a kind of, albeit primitive, empirical experiment. Not content with describing the way in which air may become the other constituent parts of the world in a somewhat abstract fashion, we can also find evidence that the beliefs of Anaximenes were applied to a more concrete description of the formation of the world. We've already earlier considered the possibility that the gods were brought about from the primal air and that soul was then granted by the gods to the living. The earth itself, however, was supposedly produced by a felting, a condensing of the primal air into the firm substance beneath our feet. Conceived as floating in the infinitely extended air that surrounds it, the shape of the earth must then be somewhat flat like a leaf, as leaves do float on air. From the earth are produced the other heavenly bodies by means of the exaltation arising from it, at least according to Hippolytus' account of Anaximenes' thought. Given that this exaltation is a process of rarefaction of the denser earth, the stars, the sun, and the moon, 
are a fully rarefied, fiery substance that also float within the air. Varying accounts give a confused impression of how exactly the heavenly bodies are supposed to work, but they are mostly considered, like the earth, as akin to leaves floating on the air, and were therefore likely supposed to be flat too. Anaximenes appears to have been quite influential to other earlier thinkers. We will likely see similar thought cropping up in the latter half of this series as some of these thinkers, according to Kirk, Raven and Schofield, would look particularly to Anaximenes for details of cosmology. I think there is a very good reason for this, and it is not necessarily the strength of his ideas. We've seen that, in a way that wasn't really true for Thales and Anaximander, Anaximenes appears to be describing the mythopoetic origins of ancient Greek common sense in the new philosophical style. The primacy of air and breath could be considered a more scientific analysis of the Homeric attributes of the soul. If the prevailing thought of ancient Greece was dictated by an understanding of Homer, then the person who can describe that thought without reference to myth would likely garner respect. Perhaps this adherence to dogma and appreciation of that adherence is also the reason that Anaximenes' thought comes through to us with a clarity and coherence that isn't apparent with his predecessors. I'm guessing, of course, the world of ancient Greece was significantly different to the world that any of us have known, and the patterns of thought that would come about in the minds of these ancients will remain opaque to us because of that. I personally feel like the attribution of material monism to the Milesian thinkers really comes about solely from Anaximenes. It certainly makes more sense in my mind that way. Throughout the ages, and far past the ancient era, the clarity of Anaximenes' ideas as they come to us may have made them much easier to dismiss than those of the more vague thinkers. We can say, he believed this and that, and it is clearly wrong, and then move on to someone who we understand a little less. But there is, I would argue, some value in studying Anaximenes, even if that is mainly that we can be aided in understanding how the myths of Homer were understood by the people of that world. If Thales was the first to think philosophically, and Anaximander was the first to write philosophically, and Anaximenes was the first to give us experimentation and example to back up his thoughts. The Milesian school, as these three are often known, is an odd grouping by my reckoning, but if we are to understand them as a school of thought, then it is one in which the way we do philosophy was refined for the betterment of those who came after them. If Miletus hadn't been destroyed, then who knows how far that city could have carried the history of Western philosophy all by itself. Thank you all so much for watching this video. As usual, I would really appreciate you all helping the channel grow by liking, subscribing and commenting, all the good stuff. Until next time then, goodbye.